I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And And this this is Celebrity Memoir Memoir Book Club. Home of the brave. And land of... The opinionated. Hell yeah, baby. Gosh, bless something. America, it's a country. (laughs) Undeniable. And one thing that is true here is that two girls are allowed to be bitchy on a podcast and you are free to listen or not listen. Enact your rights and only do what you want to do. Listen or don't listen. Ain't that the truth? And have a freaking ice cold beer and do fireworks in your neighbor's backyard. But keep your fingers behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fireworks out the mouth. <laughs> That's the safest place to do it. And I hope you have one of those popsicles that is three colors. Ugh, God bless. Anyway, Ash. Yes, Claire. Do we have anything to tell the people? Well, aside from us doing a tour of this fair country in the coming months. And Canada. And Canada. Other than that, I'm excited to see you. Happy we're here. Summertime, baby, and the living is easy. If you were to write a memoir about your life, what would you title last week's chapter? Frivolous girl in a frivolous world. Hell yeah, tell me about that. I am at the height of wedding planning, wedding picking. I'm getting shirts by the dozen, trying them all on. I'm getting shoes. I just did my wedding dress fittings last night for like my wedding dress and my after party dress. Ooh. Ugh, the shoes I got were unanimously panned. The way that people were just the venom coming out of their mouths. The attendees of the fitting? Yeah. They were like, those are the ugliest fucking shoes and you have to take them off. We can't look anymore. Someone had espadrilles on and they're like, put these on. Anything other than what you've got. Do you have pictures? It was those silver Stuart Weitzman shoes. But the problem is it like clashed with the color of the dress color theory and it made them look very cheap, which I understand. Luckily, I got them for very cheap. So no harm, no foul. But now I got to get a new pair of shoes. I had a fancy pair of white pants that I didn't love, but was going to try to make work. I figured out what shirt I'm wearing to my rehearsal dinner. And my mom and I quote said, those look like band pants, <gasps> which is like a marching band. Exactly. And I have to say, that's not a comment you could come back from. So those pants are out. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I would say you could embrace it because I know how much you love a marching band. I would love to have a marching band on premise. What if you wear the pants as a tribute to your love of brass instruments? Can I say if I wore the band pants with the silver shoes, they actually go quite nice. I'm like, I guess this is my shit outfit. And then I'm also decorating my home. And it's just a lot of choices, a lot of colors, a lot of fabrics. I literally yesterday went from like a showroom to sit on couches to a dress fitting to try on dresses. And I'm just like, who am I? The most frivolous girl in the world? I get why people get addicted to the wedding stuff because you're just like lost in the sauce. and You're like, order more. Everybody look at me. I'm trying things on. What do you think of my taste? I'm at a point where there's nothing to do but lean in. And I'm like in a reptide of capitalism. And I just say, take me out. I'm going to go limp and I'm just going to keep buying new pairs of shoes. I'm doing that thing that is so fun where you buy something on sale because it's cheap. And then now actually you just have something you hate. That was a big problem for me for a long ass time. I do think here on out, I had to buy everything wholesale because it's actually cheaper to return wholesale than to like be stuck with garbage. Oh, you mean like full price? Oh, wholesale. I was like, you're going to buy a fucking pallet of pants because it's easier to return (laughs) every jean that someone sells. Yeah. And post-wedding, I'm starting a deep. (laughs) Ashley. Yes, Claire. Tell me about your week as if you were a celebrity. I would title last week's chapter, Houston, We've Made Contact. I've been trying so hard to get fucking contact lenses. And can I say, in my very public struggle with poking myself in my own fucking eyeball, it's become very clear that actually a lot of people have struggles with contacts and no one ever talks about it. And so I'm here to represent the underrepresented, the people who cannot poke themselves in the eye for sport. It is so hard. If you don't listen to the Patreon, I went a couple weeks ago and I tried to get contact lenses. I had the doctor's appointment. They got my contact prescription. They gave me the samples. And they said, okay, and now you have to put them in your eyeball and take them out and then put them back in again before you can leave our office. And I sat there for, I believe, over an hour just trying and trying and trying. And the woman became my mortal enemy. I actually had to leave because I was like, I'm about to say the meanest thing that's ever come out of my fucking mouth. And there's no reason for me to like hurt her, but I hate her. I would try to do it and she'd go, nope, not quite. Oh, you blinked. Oh, nope. Have you ever had your finger like in your fucking eyeball and someone goes, Oh, that's not in. I fucking know it's not in. I would know if it was in because it wouldn't be on my finger anymore. It would be sticking to my eyeball, but instead it's still on my finger and therefore I'm aware that it's not in. 
like I'm happy that in a mind that would honestly, quite frankly, love to just go limp. I have a body that fights. Did you read the article about the girl who was high on meth and popped out her own eyeballs because she thought God told her to? No. Okay, well, that's the gist of it. I don't think my body does that. Thank God. <laughs> and I think the kind of person who willy nilly puts something in their eyeball nonstop is the kind of person who might willy nilly pop out an eyeball. And I just think I'm happy to be on the other side of the spectrum. Well, now I'm actually, scared to get good at contacts. To be honest, I think with actually you. you should be scared to get good at math. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're yeah. safe. She kept on going, you can't blink. You have to put it in and not blink. And I was like, oh, not blink. Let's just turn off my reflexes. Why don't we fucking knock a brick over my knee? Let's see if it swings. Like, what are you talking about? Don't blink. I do blink. That's how eyes work. They blink. Anyway, so it took me, I think, six weeks to like gather the courage to go face her again. And I went back in and I sat down and she started doing it again. And I said, you have to not talk to me. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) I said to her, That's crazy. I'm so sorry, but I can't have you talking t- to do this. I think I was there for half an hour, which is still kind of a long time. Yeah. Where does the blame fall now? Hmm. I, I will feel- say I was about to go fucking postal. It had been like two minutes. I'd done it like twice and I was about to go fucking ape shit again. She kept going. You had to just like put it in your eye and then look <laughs> up down to the side and then slowly blink. I was like, OK, so this is my second time here. I am obviously not good at this. And you're saying, oh, all you have to do is do the fucking Macarena with your eyeball. And then bop it, if you will. (laughs) I was like, what makes you think I can do that? The problem is obviously that what you're saying doesn't work. Anyway, I'm a great success. Everyone should be in awe of me. Should we get into this week's book? You guys, we have a controversial book this week. We are celebrating America's birthday by singing happy birthday, dear president. And by indulging in America's favorite pastime, which is exploiting the body of a woman in need. (laughs) Okay, so fair warning. This book is controversial because it's a memoir ascribed to Marilyn, but it's not guaranteed by her. We also brought on ghost experts. We brought on two girls, one ghost. We did a crossover episode where they read this book. And it was really interesting because they fully were like, this is Marilyn's book. Me and Ashley were like, I don't know if it's Marilyn's book. And then we did all of the ghost stories on their podcast that involve Marilyn. Marilyn shows up a lot. And she is somebody who has almost lived larger in death than in life. We are really excited to talk about it. I do think we don't know much, but we know memoirs. We were able to use all of our experience, knowing what people sound like when they tell their own story to kind of get to the bottom of, is this her story? I guess we are now partaking in the age-old tradition of using Marilyn Monroe's name for clicks. And uh, do I feel good about it? No. But? But we were excited to talk to the ghost girls. We were really yeah. very excited to like have a little ghost lore. We did feel that a 4th of July special, a spooky, spooky edition of Celebrity Memoir Book Club was in order. And may our asses get haunted. I love that July 4th is our Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> when do we have to respect? Yeah. Nah. Uh-huh. Anyway, My Story by Marilyn Monroe, I will say already a damning title. I think that she's a little bit more creative than My Story. I also wonder if she would have signed it, Marilyn Monroe. Ain't that the truth? Would her pen name have actually been Norma Jean? So she opens it straight up with, I thought the people I lived with were my parents. I call them mama and dad. The woman said to me one day, don't call me mama. You're old enough to know better. I'm not related to you in any way. You just bored here. Your mama's coming to see you tomorrow. You can call her mama if you want to. So her mom was in and out of mental hospitals her entire life. And her dad, she never knew. Yeah, she says at one point she saw a photo of a man who looked like Clark Gable. And my mother said he was killed in an auto accident in the city. I believed everything people told me in that time, but I didn't believe this. I didn't believe he was run over and dead. So something about this book is you never find out what his name is. She says she asked her mom what the name was. She never got it. She found out years later. But it's very much like a mystery in this book. Or she'll be like, my real name, my father's last name was... Fade to black. Yeah. So I wonder if the guy who wrote this just didn't know. I guess I do think, and we get into it later with the two girls and the one ghost. We talk a lot about the parts of this book that have major gaping holes. But I do think a lot of it is just that there are things we don't know because we don't know. So she goes and lives with her mom. Her mom struggled financially, of course. She had a very hard go of it. But at one point, she was able to save enough money that she bought a house and they all moved in and she moved in with this couple that would also sometimes help take care of Marilyn Monroe. So the four of them lived in this house. She bought this piano. Famously, this piano we later see in Mariah Carey's mansion, Sing Sing, mansion slash jail. It was very old piano. Didn't work that well, but it was so exciting for them to have something. And after it seems like a year or so of living there, 
Her mother's mental illness reared up. She was a manic. She had to be locked up and she was taken out of the house. And later in life, Marilyn gets the piano again. She paints it white and it becomes the famous white grand piano. But at the time, it was just sort of this empty promise. Her mom said, here's the piano. We're going to have two benches over in that corner where people will be able to sit and listen to the music. And the benches never materialized. After her mother is taken away, she goes into an orphanage where she's given a blue dress and a white shirt waist to wear with shoes with heavy soles. And it's essentially like a foster care system where she's expected to work. So she keeps getting like farmed out to these families who use her as labor, free labor. And she's just like, I knew that my value was working hard and being quiet. So she would go. And she was also taller and like a little bit bigger than the other kids. So she was just like a sturdy laborer. I often felt lonely and wanted to die. I would try to cheer myself up with daydreams. I never dreamed of anyone loving me as I saw other children loved. The families with whom I lived had one thing in common, a need for $5. I was also an asset in the house. I was strong and healthy and able to do as much work as a grown up. And I learned not to bother anyone by talking or crying. But then throughout this, she has all these kind of asides. She talks about going to church. And she says, I wanted desperately to stand up naked for God and everyone else to see. I had to clench my teeth and sit on my hands to keep myself from undressing. Sometimes I had to pray hard and beg God to stop me from taking my clothes off. She's always getting into trouble. She's just like always in a riff of some kind. She's kind of a magnet for people's attention, but in a sort of like negative and jealous way. Then one day I found out about sex without asking any questions. I was almost nine and I lived with a family that rented a room to a man named Kimmel. He was a stern looking man and everybody respected and called him Mr. Kimmel. This is when she's staying with another family, I guess, who had borders and he molested her. And when she went to tell somebody, they said, don't you say anything about Mr. Kimmel. Mr. Kimmel's a fine man. He's a star boarder. I cried in bed that night and wanted to die. I thought if there's nobody ever on my side that I can talk to, I'll start screaming. But I didn't scream. At 12, I looked like a girl of 17. My body was developed and shapely, but no one knew this but me. I still wore the blue dress and the blouse from the orphanage. So one day she borrows a sweater and everyone finds out that there's a body under there, a smaller, tighter sweater. Yeah. And she says, I wasn't aware of anything sexual in their new liking for me. And there was no sex thoughts in my mind. I didn't think of my body as having anything to do with sex. And this is a theme throughout here that for a very long, she has no interest in sex. She doesn't even know about sex. Nobody told her about sex. She had no sexual feelings towards anyone. Just for whatever reason, people are always whistling at her. Why I was a siren, I hadn't the faintest idea. There were no thoughts of sex in my head. I didn't want to be kissed. I used to lie awake at night wondering why the boys came after me. I didn't want them that way. She wants to just play. Like, she just wants friendship. I paid no attention to the whistles and whoops. In fact, I didn't hear them. I was full of a strange feeling as if I were two people. One of them was Norma Jean from the orphanage who belonged to nobody. The other was someone whose name I didn't know, but I knew where she belonged. She belonged to the ocean and the sky and the whole world. So in order to get the attention off of her, her aunt Grace suggests that she just get married and it gets her out of the foster system. It gets boys to stop chasing her because now she's kind of owned by one man, not kind of literally. So she marries this man named Jim Doherty and she's 15 or 16 years old. I think he's like 18 or 19. I think he's 20. My marriage brought me neither happiness nor pain. My husband and I hardly spoke to each other. This wasn't because we were angry. We had nothing to say. I've seen many married couples since that were just like Jim and me. They were usually more enduring kind of marriages, the ones that were pickled in silence. So their marriage eventually falls apart because he's ready to have a child and she has no interest in having a baby. The thought of having a baby stood my hair on end. I could see it only as myself, another Norma Jean in an orphanage. She tells a story about when they would have dinner together as a married couple. She would like go out and play with all the kids on the street, like the 12-year-olds, because that's who she felt she belonged with better. I was very sad. She says, I'd been a sort of child bride. Now I was sort of a child widow. He didn't die, though. They just got divorced. But whatever. I guess dead to her. So she's 19 years old now. She's moved to an apartment in Los Angeles and she's getting jobs. She says the sort of instincts that leads the duck to water led me to photographer studios. I got jobs posing for ads and layouts. So she's becoming a model and she develops an interest in acting and becoming a movie star. And she just sort of starts making the rounds of the studios. I guess that's how you did it. You just kind of show up and be like, any movie jobs over here? However, she's always getting attention. She talks about this man, Bill Cox, who's an older man with a wife who kind of takes her in almost like a daughter. She's walking down the street one day and this soldier is like, I'll do anything to marry you. We'll go back to this farm my parents have in Ohio, please. People are always taking deep personal interest in her, but she's not finding mass success. Yeah, the thing is, a lot of random people and even people in the movie industry like want her as theirs, but they don't want to put her in the movies. She's told so many times that she just doesn't have the right look to be a movie star. She's told all the time that she's not photogenic. 
I've never read anything about the Hollywood I knew in those first years. The Hollywood I knew was the Hollywood of failure. Nearly everybody I met suffered from malnutrition or suicidal impulses. It was like the line in the poem, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Fame, fame everywhere, but not a hello for us. But then she says, when I remember this desperate lie-telling dime-hunting Hollywood I knew only a few years ago, I get a little homesick. It was a more human place than the paradise I dreamed of and found. The people in it, the phonies and the failures were more colorful than the great men and successful artists I was soon to know. And she meets people who are like trying to set her up with financial success. Her agent tries to set her up with a man who is older and dying because she'll just definitely get at least a million dollars when he dies. And on the other hand, there's other people setting her up to get like casting couch. And so she tells stories about being in situations and going, the whole thing was fake. He didn't work for Goldwyn. It wasn't his office. He had pulled the audition gag in order to get me alone on a couch. I ran kicking and screaming. Hollywood's a place where they'll pay you $1,000 for a kiss and 50 cents for your soul. It may be different in other places, but in Hollywood, being virtuous is as juvenile sounding phrase as having the mumps. She talks about men were constantly saying like, you don't have to have sex with me. Just I'll give you an allowance to be my girl. I'm not buying you. I'm not buying you. And she goes, if you're giving me money, you want to buy me. Nobody gives money because they don't want more. I don't like men with fancy schemes like you. I like straightforward wolves better. I know how to get along with them, but I'm always nervous with the liars. She's doing a bit of modeling and she's hard up for cash. She's about to lose her car or she does lose her car and she needs, I think, $50 to get it back. And a photographer she knows wants to do a nude calendar. And she agrees to do it because nobody will recognize her because she doesn't have any fame yet. So she does it. She starts getting hired for bit roles by these big studios. She's getting like $40 here and there. She's like basically hired for permanent on background. And every once in a while, she'll get to be a featured background actor. And then come movie, her part's always been cut. So it's pretty damning. And she's like, I guess I'm a really bad actress. And she gets brought in at 20th Century Fox. And that's when she changes her name from Norma Jean to Marilyn Monroe because she needs a famous name. And an odd thing happened to me. I fell in love with myself. Not how I was, but how I was going to be. She spends a lot of money on acting lessons. My illusions didn't have anything to do with being a fine actress. I knew how third rate I was. I could actually feel my lack of talent as if it were cheap clothes I was wearing inside. (laughs) But what gets her nervous is that people keep telling her she's not photogenic because she's like, there's nothing you can do about the way she looks. Yeah. I'm like, ironically, just wait 100 years. Oh, if only you were around today. The face you're born with, as Amy Schumer once said, a mere suggestion. (laughs) (laughs) She meets another actor named George Sanders, who just right off the bat wants to marry her. So her whole thing is that even though she's not in the movie, she's getting invited to all the parties. And she instinctively knows that to be in the movies, you have to be famous. And to be famous, you could be in the movies or you could be at parties. And so she's always going and like turning it on and just listening to men. She has this way where she'll just sit there and let a man talk at her. And I guess it doesn't make her sick. She sometimes likes it. But this George Sanders, who thinks she's so amazing and wants to marry her, it starts her long living beef with Zsa Zsa Gabor, the Hungarian bombshell. Even though all of this felt very suspicious, when she takes this swipe at Zsa Zsa Gabor's looks, I was like, Marilyn didn't write this. We don't know her. She could be a petty mean bitch. The thing is, I believe she's a petty mean bitch, but I also believe she's like so aware of what the people want to receive from her that she like wouldn't have written down something petty. So Zsa Zsa Gabor throws a fit that Marilyn Monroe is at this party because she knows that Marilyn and George had this flirtation. I walked over to have a look at this Hungarian bobshell. I saw that she was one of those blondes who puts on 10 years when you take a close look at them. I just feel like that's like saying, fuck you, you dumb whore in modern language. No, I feel like that's saying you're ugly in modern language. Do you know what I mean? Like it's an intense ugly. 10 years back then was 100 years today. The inflation rate of aging. Yeah. Especially with all the cigarette smoke and none of the sunscreen. To be 30 in Hollywood in 1920s. Without the hair chemicals. So she's going to these parties to just make herself a part of the scene. And she becomes known as Joe Schneck's girl. Mr. Schneck is one of the movie executives and he brings her around. He gets her in with the studio. He was interested in me because I was a good table ornament and because I was what he called an offbeat personality. I seldom spoke three words during dinner, but would sit at Mr. Shank's elbow and listen like a sponge. The fact that people began to talk about me being Joe Shank's girl didn't annoy me at first. Oh, it's Shank. (laughs) Why did I think it was Schneck? I feel like that was just like a good old timey name. I liked sitting at the fireplace with Mr. Shank and hearing him talk about love and sex. He was so full of wisdom on these subjects like a great explorer. Okay. Has any woman really ever loved sitting around listening to a man talk about love and sex? No. Especially when you're not having love and sex with him. So anyway, it gets back to some studio and they get mad because they're like, if, well, if you can't be my girl and you're his girl, then what's the point of having you at all? So she gets fired. He goes, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to get you with another studio. 
So he gets her a meeting with another studio and that studio just tries to cast and couch her. I drove to my room in my car. Yes, there was something special about me and I knew what it was. I was the kind of girl they found dead in a hall bedroom with an empty bottle of sleeping pills in her hand. So every time she gets let go from a studio or every time she doesn't get an audition, she gets very low. When you're young and healthy, you can plan to commit suicide on Monday and by Wednesday, you're laughing again. Things seem horrible, but every time things are the worst, her bottom is getting a little bit higher and higher. Like she's starting to come bounce back faster. She falls in love with a movie star. She kind of loses herself to that for a little bit. She tells the story about what it's like to love a man who you know will never love you properly. I said goodbye to him. He stood staring at me as I told him how I felt. I cried, sobbed, and ended up in his arms. But a week later, I said goodbye again. This time, I walked out of his house with my head up. Two days later, I was back. There was a third and fourth goodbye, but it was like rushing to the edge of a roof to jump off. I stopped each time and didn't jump and turned to him and begged him to hold me. It's hard to do something that hurts your heart, especially when it's a new heart and you think that one hurt might kill it. He didn't love me. A man can't love a woman for whom he feels half contempt. He can't love her if his mind is ashamed of her. And so then she says goodbye for good. And then he becomes obsessed with her. Of course, the tale is old as time. He came back again, as I had done before. He loved me now. He met me in the street and walked beside me, pouring his heart out. But it didn't mean anything. So then she gets a bit part in a Groucho Marx movie, which is very exciting for her. She crushes it. They make her part bigger than she thought, which is the first time she's ever gone in and not seen herself cut out completely. And then they ask her to promote the movie, to go on an exploitation tour for the film. And she hates it. She like overdresses. She thought New York would be cold. And so she shows up and it's a hot New York summer. And she's like, get me home. But she is kind of a bombshell. She's like, everywhere she goes, they're like, hot Marilyn cools us down or whatever. Yeah, she becomes very famous for being very hot. Everywhere on the press tour, they want to take a picture of her in a bathing suit. So her whole press tour is you get to the hotel. They put her in a bathing suit. They put her out by the pool. Someone takes a picture. She goes inside. She goes to dinner. And then it's on to the next city. So then she gets offered a real part in Asphalt Jungle and she has to do the audition and she's so in her head. She, for some reason, goes to read and she says, I stretched myself out on the floor and Bill crouched down beside me. I felt much better. I had rehearsed the part lying on a couch. This wasn't any couch in the office. Lying on the floor was almost the same thing. She gets on the floor and does her part and then she's like, let me do it again. And they're like, you don't have to. You already got the role, but she insists on doing it again. And you can see that she's very insecure about her acting abilities. Anyway, Asphalt Jungle is a huge hit and specifically her. And the studios are still fighting and saying she's not a star. She's not a star. She's not photogenic. But the audience reaction does not lie. She was there. Her manager was there. She has this manager named Johnny Hyde. And he's like, I know there's something special. The response is overwhelming. The problem is they want to ease you into being a star and you're not. You're either the star of a movie or you're nothing, but you can't be some side character. And one day someone's going to see that about you and let you really shine. Johnny, of course, is in love with her and keeps asking her to marry him. As is a lot of men's angles. He's like, well, I just found out I'm going to die soon. Will you marry me now? (laughs) And she says she'll only marry for love. No other reason at all. So she refuses to marry him, even though he's like, I've got to give my fortune to someone. And I'm like, well, then don't you have a will? Just give it to her anyway. Also, she does love him. Just not romantically. She says he's the kindest man in the world. So then she gets all about Eve. And she does this with George Sanders and Jaja Gabor says nobody on set's allowed to talk to her. And then she has a little aside about what she likes in a man. She doesn't like men with perfect teeth because they are just too perfect overall. And she says overall, when it comes to men, she likes someone who just hits on her outright. She doesn't want someone who shows up with good intentions, but secretly just wants to hit on her because she wants to know right off the bat where she stands with someone. And I respect that. The chief drawback with men is that they are too talkative. I don't mean intellectual men who are full of ideas and information about life. It's always a delight to hear such men talk because they are not talking boastfully. Mm. The over-talkative men who bore me are the ones who talk about themselves. Such men are a total loss. And then she says, I've always had a talent for irritating women since I was 14. Wives have the tendency to go off like burglar alarms when they see their husbands talking to me. She says, women also don't like the way I talk. They think that my voice is too premeditated. But she says in general, she doesn't mind jealousy. I would rather a thousand women were jealous of me than I was jealous of one of them. I've been jealous and it's no fun. I don't know. It all kind of feels like fan fiction. Someone like projecting a personality that they're like believing on. Sometimes I've been to a party where no one spoke to me a whole evening. The men frightened by their wives or sweeties would give me a wide berth and the ladies would gang up in a corner to discuss my dangerous character. She says, women, if you can't treat your man right, that's not my fault. (laughs) And then she goes on this whole thing about how men are always like lying about who they are. And she says, as far as I can make out, women's friendships with each other are based on a gush of lies. I don't know. She prides herself on being very truthful, but it's very hard to tell because there aren't really any examples of like real relationships. But maybe it's because she didn't have many. 
So then Johnny Hyde dies, and that's very sad for her. She says he was the kindest man in the world. And then she has this weird thing about how dumb she was. And so she goes to USC to take classes and starts reading more books. She has a story about how Joan Crawford they met, and she tells her, like, you have to have taste, you have to dress better. And then later, she's very hurt because when Marilyn Monroe does something at the Oscars, Joan Crawford is like, ugh, the Oscars have gone downhill. And she was very hurt by that. Yeah. Well, she and Joan Crawford get into this thing because at the time, Marilyn doesn't really own any things. And Joan is like, I want to help you dress better. Send me a list of everything you own. And Marilyn is so ashamed to be like, I own four things. So then she never responds. And then she and Joan have this kind of beef because Joan, I think, feels rejected that Marilyn wouldn't let her help her. But Marilyn is like, well, there was no help to be done. I couldn't buy new things. Success came to me in a rush. It surprised my employers much more than it did me. Even when I had played only a few bit parts in a few films, all the movie magazines and newspapers started printing my pictures and giving me write-ups. I used to tell lies in my interviews, chiefly about my mother and father. I said that she was dead and he was somewhere in Europe. I lied because I was ashamed to have the world know my mother was in a mental institution. And about her success, she really just says it was good. I liked the fact that I was important in making these films a great financial success. There was always romance in the air, but instead of being happy over all these fairy tale things that had happened to me, I grew depressed and finally desperate. My life suddenly seemed as wrong and unbearable to me as it had in those days of my early despairs. She also has her nudes come back out, that calendar, and she's so scared everything's going to come to a crushing halt. And they're like, oh, no, 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 this can only help you. And then she goes on to do Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, How to Marry a Millionaire. And it's like, okay, yeah, that did help me. That did help. But she grows very resentful of her success almost. She's very resentful of the people who want a piece of her now that she's very famous. And she starts becoming so late to everything. She would just show up like two hours late to dinner. She would just be in the bath for hours and hours and hours. I've always thought that movie stars were exciting and talented people full of special personality. Meeting one of them at a party, I discover that usually that he or she is colorless and even frightened. I've often stood silent at a party for hours listening to my movie idols turn into dull and little people. So she becomes more and more famous. She becomes more and more famous for being just such a vixen. And she's like, I'm never sexy on screen, really. Like, I'm never wearing anything vulgar. People think of me as this, like, bombshell, but I'm just in the movie. Also, she has a lot of treaties on how fame works and how men get famous and how women get famous and all the different ways to get famous. There's a lot of talk of fame. More talk of fame than there is of acting. Yeah, more talk of fame than there is of her personhood. And then she meets Joe DiMaggio. He's mysterious. They're all out to dinner, but she notices an excitement in his eyes and she's very drawn to him. I thought I was going to meet a loud, sporty fellow. Instead, I found myself smiling at a reserved gentleman in a gray suit with a gray tie and a sprinkle of gray in his hair. If I hadn't been told he was some sort of ball player, I wouldn't have guessed he was either a steel magnate or a congressman. His silence wasn't an act. It was his way of being himself. He walks her to her car that night and a flirtation kicks off. Something was starting between Mr. DiMaggio and me. It was always nice when it started, always exciting, but it always ended up in dullness. So she really just doesn't have very high hopes for this romance, but she's so drawn to him and so excited about it. And he is very worried about taking up with someone who has such a public persona because he doesn't want to open his life up to the public in that way. And she's like, don't worry, it can just be me. And he's like, I don't know if that's true. And then she talks about some famous moment where she's doing something for the veterans and someone takes a photo of her from above and it's all cleavage and people are so mad at her. This is one thing. This is actually very par for the celebrity memoir course is like, do you remember that tabloid scandal? No. Okay. Well, can I explain it to you? I wasn't trying to look slutty. I just, uh, someone was up high. I didn't bend down. So Joe asks that she start wearing higher up tops just in case people are perched above her taking photos. And she gets into a bit of a tiff with her studio because they want her to do this movie that she has absolutely no interest in. So she ends up taking some time off to just travel with Joe. And she does some singing for the troops famously because she just has nothing really waiting for her back home. And so then finally, she's going out to Korea to perform for the troops. And here's where it ends. She's about to go on stage. I changed into my silk gown as quickly as I could. It had a low neckline and no sleeves. I felt worried all of a sudden about my material, not the Gershwin song, but the others I was going to sing, Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. It seemed like the wrong thing to say to soldiers in Korea, earning only soldiers' pay. Then I remembered the dance I did after the song. It was a cute dance. I knew they would like it. And that's where it ends. I feel like it's so hard to read anything about her without taking in the information from just like the collective unconscious. Yeah. You know so much lore. Yes. And so it's so hard to read this being like, well, is this just regurgitated lore or is this a close study of her? Yeah. Or is it her manuscript? Or is it her ghost? (laughs) 
Let's bring on two girls, one ghost and get to the bottom of it. I'm so excited. We had such a fun conversation about what we thought about this book, what comes across in this book, how a man would write a woman versus how a woman would write herself. And try as we might, nobody can stop from projecting their own views on Marilyn Monroe. And I'm so excited for this conversation. I hope you guys enjoy. And if you like this conversation, we are also on their podcast this week talking about Marilyn Monroe ghost stories. We are here with Two Girls, One Ghost. Thank you guys so much for joining us with a connection to Marilyn. (laughs) Speaking through you, she is here. Have you guys read many celebrity memoirs before or do you read nonfiction in general? Where do you stand on the memoir topic? I love a memoir. I have read, I feel like I've read a lot of the industry related ones. Tina Fey, Bossy Pants. Um, I'm glad my mom died. Yeah. Sick in the head. Just a bunch of like the writers, actors, those ones, which I usually love to listen to, especially if they narrate it themselves. Because there's a lot of humor added to those too. Yeah. Whereas Whereas this this one is very (laughs) different. (laughs) And nonfiction too, like I've read those same sort of books, but nonfiction, I feel like I tend to go a little bit darker, like politics and government and like dark history. And so it is interesting. Serial killer stuff. Yeah. yeah, Serial killers. (laughs) Yeah. Crime. So this was kind of a first foray for me into a celebrity memoir that's like this. I will say it is fun being in Los Angeles where so much of her story takes place. Yeah. We're recording from LA right now. So you joked that she's with us, but we're close to her, maybe. So having read a handful of memoirs before and now diving into this book that was by Marilyn Monroe and called my story to remind us that it is her story, who do you think wrote this book? Well, you two teased that you don't believe it It was her. (laughs) Right. Which never crossed my mind. Never crossed my mind. Not one bit. Because so why do you think that? This is cheating. But if you look on like the Amazon where we bought it, it's like contested whether or not it was her. It's also in the author's note that it's contested whether or not it was her. And I can tell from the way that it was written that this is not somebody's first time writing a book. I also felt distinctly that the way it was written and maybe and the weird thing about Marilyn and talking about Marilyn is I feel that there is no her. There's only people's projections on her. So That's sad. true. And everyone wants to like touch her fame and her name. Yes. It's so gross. Everyone from like disgusting men to Lena Dunham to like Anna de Armas, everybody has this idea. Kim of Kardashian. They, yeah. Everybody yeah. has this idea who they think she is. And so maybe I'm projecting upon her, but I read this book like, oh, this is a man's fantasy of a woman because so much of it was about how nobody could buy her. And she was just so sexy, but she wouldn't be bought. And she only cared about love. And she doesn't care if you're poor. And women are so jealous of her. And it just, it felt very written by a man to me. But then the thing is, I have to check myself and be like, I don't know, Claire, maybe Marilyn Monroe is not your perfect idea of a feminist woman. But I did feel like the way that she's like, I put on a too tight sweater and suddenly everybody loved me and the women hated me. And I'm like, that's not how women speak. Hearing this makes, that makes so much sense because as I was reading it, I was like, my heart was aching for her because, well, one, I did feel like it really did feel like reading a journal of a child. That's why I think yeah. my heart was aching for her because I was like, this poor woman was just like such a naive, childlike woman, which based on her upbringing, like I could totally see being true. But now that you bring up that point, I'm like, oh, that is like the perfect way a man would view a woman, like only caring about love, being so innocent and not meaning to what was the quote oh it was something about why she was having so many issues with her different production companies she gave off sex vibrations and that was her issue was regardless of what she did she gave off sex vibrations or something i found very suspicious was that she kept being like and i am dumb and the thing about me is i'm just so dumb and i don't know a thing about the world and i was like that's not anything a dumb person even says that is what a man thinks a perfect woman would be Somebody who knows she's so stupid because she doesn't read the newspaper, but she's looking for a man to tell. I mean, how many times in this book does she go? And I love listening to a smart man just teach me about love and sex in the world. And I'm so lucky to listen to him. How many times does she say that? Yeah. Okay. But she does also say, I'm now I'm torn. I know because because I think we like you and I probably went in already viewing that she had written it that she had written it and knowing a lot of the way that her death has been mistreated and misused i think we went in reading her voice in sort of like a meek 
abused child's voice. And so I think maybe the things that sounded like when you were, re- it's all about the tone that you read it into, yeah. right? Like one sentence could sound really misogynistic. Like it's not her. Like because it's a, the, the, it's a white man well, <laughs> writing the sentence this story that I wanted. Her. Yeah. Cause to, just to finish my thought was she also calls out how Hollywood men just want to hear themselves talk in that way. I feel like a man wouldn't write that. I have an alternative theory. Okay. Sort of. That I do believe that this is fan fiction, but like extremely researched fan fiction that Mm. potentially was based off of like journal entries, watching her every interview, like someone who has a deep obsession with her. And therefore, it is a male fantasy, but it is the only man who understands her. Like all of the other men are just like Hollywood people who love to hear themselves talk. And that's why she was never seen by them. And they didn't appreciate her the way the freak who wrote this can, you know, like I do think. That there is this like admiration and adoration and also a belief that they are understanding her the way no one else ever has or could. And like I do believe that they are drawing from a well of information. And so it's not just like random. Most of this story I don't believe is just like thrown together. But I kind of think the like Mm -hmm. emotion and the inflection in certain places is like put on her by someone who like imagines that they get her. Yeah. I think I so badly wanted it to be written by her because of how skewed and grandiose people have made her story. And like you were saying, everyone wants a piece of her. And so I was really hoping that this was her opportunity to share her perspective. But that's maybe a little bit of wishful thinking. But I think like we're all participating in that. Right. Exactly. Like, let's face reality here. We're about to release two podcast episodes where all we do is talk about Marilyn Monroe. So like, yeah, we are contributing to it in a way, trying to come at it with the most respect and adoration that we can. But I think also part of the reason I really did think that she had written this, and obviously I'm taking into (laughs) your perspectives and I'm like, wow, maybe I should reread this now (laughs) with a different lens. But nobody knows Marilyn Monroe. No She's the only person that understands herself and knows her yeah. own life and all of her inner thinkings. But I did find it really interesting that throughout this book, she was basically saying how detached she was to her body and her life. Yeah. And even Marilyn Monroe, like there was a part of this book where she had initially been fired from one of the production houses. And she was crying because she thought that this was the death of Marilyn Monroe, this character that she created, that she was constantly trying to be reminded of and absorb what everyone else was saying Marilyn Monroe is and try to remember who she's supposed to be playing. And I feel like if this was written by her, it felt like she the entire time was completely lost and didn't truly know exactly who she was. And even there were chapters written about her experiences at different parties and conversing with people. And it was like, I'm bored sometimes. I sit there and I forget to smile. I forget to talk. Which I related to to so much. Yeah. (laughs) But that doesn't come out. It's not making headlines that Marilyn Monroe is bored in the back of a party and leaves early or whatever. It's that she's oozing sex and she's seducing all these men. And so regardless of how she behaved, she was this person that she tried to... She tried to live up to her persona that people created for her. Exactly. That was the lens I was reading it from. And I agree with that. I think that there is this persona that people have created for her. So, Okay, here's another reason I don't think it could have been her (laughs) is because the writing is so straightforward. It's so to the point. It really does feel like it's like taking you from interview to interview to journal entry to interview That's and then true. like filling in the emotions behind it. Because I will say, especially in older memoirs, I mean, we just read Jane Fonda's book and she and Marilyn Monroe were like in the same acting class at one point. So like they are from a similar era and there is not a single memoir we've read from the older generation that wasn't just like loopy nonsense. They love to just like Mm. explain things in the least straightforward way you've ever heard in your life. Yeah. And the other thing that I want to say that is interesting, this is a part that really struck me, is the way that they talk about her one-sided feuds. Like it really feels like someone who's deeply in Marilyn Monroe's corner who like accidentally lets their hatred for people who've been mean to her steep out at some points because... There's all these like one-sided feuds. All these people just like randomly hate her. And then when she's talking about Zsa Zsa Gabor, it's like the shadiest paragraph I've ever read in my life. I need to find it real quick. 
Is it the one where she ate lunch with her husband? I think it was after their first argument or something. When she's like, I didn't see the bombshell, the Hungarian bombshell. I walked over to have a look at this Hungarian bombshell. I saw that she was one of those blondes who put on 10 years if you take a close look at them. Yes. Oh, yes. (laughs) It was a mean, mean line. (laughs) Holy shit. Do you know what I mean? Like, to me, that was the writer, like, being unable to conceal their fucking disdain because it, like, doesn't match with the rest of the character that they're creating throughout this book. And when I first read it, I was like, oh, my God, Marilyn, really letting your true colors show. And by the end of the book, I was like, who wrote that? Yeah. (laughs) But if she was this sort of abused and taken advantage of character, do you think that there was something in her that wasn't fully comprehending how what she says affects other people because she was someone who was constantly told things about her appearance and who she was in a very matter of fact and rude and disgusting way. So do you think that there's some internalized misogyny there? I mean, it's very possible. And it reminds me of, we read Holly Madison's book. This is going to sound crazy, but Holly Madison reminds me of Raquel, who if this reading that we have of this book is Marilyn Monroe is correct, it would be that similar kind of like lack of ability to have empathy. I would think and I would hope, and again, this is like me projecting that any woman who has been submitted to such scrutiny physically would like learn their lesson and not want to do it to somebody else, especially in the written word. I think it's very easy in a book to be the best version of yourself because there's edits and there's edits and however mad you are in the moment, you go back and you go, take that line out. It's kind of mean. But maybe Marilyn Monroe was a fucking bitch and she didn't care that people were mean to her about how she looked. She was going to be mean right back. I write for TV and like I've worked with a lot of women who on the surface are like, I support women. I want to help build women's careers. And then really don't. They are saying that because they know it's the right thing to say, Mm -hmm. but they have this internalized, maybe it's misogyny. Maybe it's like their upbringing in the industry where they don't want to see women succeed because they've been taught that their competition, that there isn't room for everyone, that there's only room for like one woman. So there is like part of me that maybe, and especially in an industry like acting in Hollywood where fame is so fleeting. And especially a woman who had been told you're not photogenic by two major studios. Like you're right. Yeah, right. Maybe she was like, you think I'm ugly? She's ugly. <laughs> yeah. And like yeah. another thing I want to say is the reason it struck me is because you don't see that anywhere else really in the book. But that's also because you don't really see her talking about another woman directly almost anywhere else in the book. She will like mention the stars who came before her and she'll mention the men in her life, but there are no women for her to like insult. So you are yeah. right that that does stand out as maybe just like the internalized misogyny showing and like the other places it shows it's not written out because she doesn't write about women at all. Well, I would like to actually quote one of the few things she does say about women. Men sometimes didn't bother to find out who and what I was. Instead, they would invent a character for me and I wouldn't argue with them. But this isn't better to her than what it's like to be with women. And she goes, it's more difficult than being straightforward with women. Men are often pleased when you tell them the truth about how you feel, but very few women want to hear. As far as I can make out, women's friendships with each other are based on a gush of lies and pretty speeches that mean nothing. You'd think they were all wolves trying to seduce each other the way they flatter and flirt when they're together. Maybe that's specifically about Hollywood. I was going to say, because everything she says about Hollywood is very negative. I'm not going to find the quote quick enough, but there was even a section where she was talking about how she doesn't understand how everyone just like gets dressed up and goes to these parties that are so boring just to stand around and look at each other and hear themselves talk in the very next paragraph. She's like, well, I'm doing it, but it's for marketing purposes. And it's like, well, can't you understand that everyone else is probably doing the the exact same same? thing? Can I say that's the exact Holly Madison disease, which is Holly Madison. And we got a lot of flack for not liking Holly Madison. But in her book, she's like, listen, everyone thought I was a dumb blonde just because of the way I looked, but I'm actually a lot more. And she's like, but the other girls, they actually are dumb blondes. And then she'd be like, but I haven't talked to them. It makes me so sad. It makes me so sad. And it says so much about society. The fact that that is ingrained in so many women's minds. I have a hard time though with the lack of empathy from women. Like I do understand that we were all raised in a culture of misogyny and it takes time to unlearn and it's difficult to not see other women as competition. But I do think if you're sitting down and reviewing your own life in a memoir, if you're taking time to reflect and you're writing out pages of pages of begging people to see you for who you really are, you have to be able to extend that kind of compassion to people and women who are in your identical situation. And I didn't see that here. I also, I just want to like jump back to the writing really quickly because I agree with Ashley. And I feel like this is something that you might not notice if you don't read a ton of these memoirs, but it is well-written. 
And yeah. what Ashley was saying about how it's so to the point, it takes a very disciplined and I think experienced writer to be able to know what matters. And I think a woman like Marilyn Monroe, who has been through so much, wouldn't be able to so quickly within 15 pages go from being an orphan to being abandoned to her mom's mental health problems to getting married at 16, to getting divorced at 19, the way that she is able to find very specific examples of moments in time with that man, with the fake audition, the man who was the fake veteran, like all those little tiny specific examples of the larger themes of her life. It is very difficult as a writer to find those moments to represent the year and then move on quickly. And the fact that they're able to be so succinct in this book makes me think she doesn't write it. The other thing that makes me think she didn't write it was this line. She goes, I drove to my room in my car. Yes, there was something special about me and I knew what it was. I was the kind of girl they found dead in a hall bedroom with an empty bottle of sleeping pills in her hand. Which is such foreshadowing to her death. Which makes me think, did somebody who already knew how she died wrote this? I don't think that that's something you put in your memoir when you're still 10 years out from being dead. It's so (laughs) fascinating because we'll talk about this on our episode about Marilyn and the ghost stories, but there's such a conspiracy about her death. And so I read the book first and then I read more about the conspiracy of her death. This was under the perspective of like she wrote it. I was Mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, someone did murder her. And it's perfect because she's already written that she's going to die with the bottle of pills next to her. So someone could pose it like that and no one would ask questions because they expected it. I want to know, like, what did you guys think about her based on what you were hearing on these ghost stories? Is there like a specific Marilyn that comes through? Or are they all so varied because different people want to see different things? They were varied. They were very varied. There's some that involve a bit of her, I guess, being a little bit more angry. There's some where she loves that everyone's talking about her. She loves that everyone appreciates her life. And she loves looking at herself in the mirror. Right. And then she's also, you know, hiding on a pier and trying to just absorb other happy people and families because she didn't get to live that life. So it's all over the place. Part of me is like, well, that makes sense because human beings are so varied in our experiences and what we desire to do. Like our emotions can be all over the place and one hour can be completely different than the next. And so to assume that her spirit would be so uniform and do the same thing and behave and show up the same way if she is an active haunting, because that's another thing that, you know, we've learned from all of our research of paranormal is there's active hauntings where it's assumed that there's a spirit that's really conscious, maybe not completely aware that they're dead, but they're engaging with people versus a residual haunting where there's an energy that has just created this sort of stain in a place. So residual hauntings are more of like, if everyone sees the same woman in white kind of come out the elevator doors at 12 a.m. on a Tuesday every five years. You know, that sort of thing. The ghost stories did make me angry, which I'm excited, not excited really, but (laughs) I'm excited to hear your reactions when we do talk about them because it does reiterate and reemphasize what we were talking about of people just wanting the narrative to be a part of their lives and then connect themselves to Marilyn. It's just like self-gratifying. This is a question for like the paranormal experts. Like (laughs) we're not experts, let me tell you. (laughs) We're enthusiasts. (laughs) Yeah. Would your soul not find some kind of peace? Do people not find peace when you're dead? Because I feel like when a human being goes from falling in love with herself in the mirror to feeling so alone, that is such a symptom of like trauma and insecurity. And I feel like those highs and lows are very often seen in the entertainment industry. And it makes sense because like you can go from being like, I wouldn't marry me either. I'm the greatest thing at the party, like the highs and the lows. But you would hope that in death, maybe she would have a moment of peace. Like after all these years, she would be less angry, but maybe not. When I was researching some of the ghost stories, it did remind me of the Bell Witch, which is this one case in Tennessee where there's this woman who the theory is basically a part of her life that was angered and rejected and traumatized, chipped off from her soul. And while the majority of her soul moved on, there was this thing that kind of stayed and festered and turned into this sort of monster. And there's now a lot of I almost said evidence. There's, there's not <laughs> there's evidence. No evidence. There's no evidence. But <laughs> there's now a lot of conversation when it comes to spirits and souls that people who even in their living life, if they have a traumatic experience, that there's this part of them, almost like the inner child, which is hiding away and it's chipped off and it's not really a part of you. You have to find it. You have to heal it. And so I did wonder if some of these versions of Marilyn's spirit that we're seeing maybe are some of these pieces of her that were left behind and we're just seeing a lot of her trauma. We don't know. (laughs) We don't know. 
but that's the beauty of ghost stories is we never know. <laughs> and I feel like if there is a version of her that like moved on and there is chips that are haunting Hollywood, I feel like they deserve it. The Hollywood people to be haunted. Oh, Do you know what I mean? I will say when we bought this book, I did find it on thrift books. And there was a part of my brain that was like, this is a book written by Marilyn Monroe. I don't think we would have even considered covering it if there was no part of me that thought right. that it like couldn't well, have been Well, because look at her. the cover but on thrift books. Like this is an old ass looking book. So I also was holding yes, this. But then mine has- <laughs> is very much the essence of people trying to have their own story. Yours like, has photographs. So is mine. Mine doesn't even have a cover. Mine's naked, just like Marilyn on those calendars. Everything relates back to Marilyn. <laughs> totally exposed. Well, it's interesting what you said about how succinct her writing was. And I agree. I just assumed that there was a lot of heavy editing after the fact. And when it was published, people went through and like ripped things out and pieced it together to make it a better version. I just assumed she kind of was like, here's my dear diary sort of situation. Yeah. But I was kind of torn as I was reading it because I have people in my life who they over explain things from years of not being able to explain things. And so they speak we see that more, a lot. But at the same time, that's the version of them that now understands that they like have a voice and they're being heard. And there is a line in here where Marilyn says, that she often doesn't finish sentences. And so I was like, <laughs> maybe that can be applied to the rest of this book where it is very succinct. It jumps very quickly from moment to moment without much information on what she was thinking and feeling because she is so used to not being heard that she barely finishes her sentences. And so she has to go really quick and get all the highlights and everything that's most important that she has to say out immediately because she doesn't know how much time she has someone's attention for, at least her, for her voice. I mean, it's hard because you could really read it any and every way. Yeah. Right. Right. The thing that I found interesting is how abruptly it stopped in the middle of like the Korean yes. War. And I was like, I want to ask Memoris when they're writing, was there not an outline? Either way you see it, like she must have had a couple of scribbles somewhere about what would have come next. Or at the very least, if it wasn't written by her, why would they stop there? Okay. Well, now with your theory of it being written by someone else, it's almost like, oh, let's make it even more believable. If we end it here in the middle of the story, she hasn't finished it, then it maybe does feel more like she wrote it. But this is so perfectly, edited. you don't write a perfectly edited book, like sentence by sentence like this. Yeah, right. Well, and to your point too, at the end, Sabrina was like, oh, what did you think of the end? And I was like, oh my gosh, that was so perfect. Because you know, now when we think about her 60 to 80 years later, we think of you know, diamonds are a girl's best friend and sultry singing of happy birthday, Mr. President. And I was like, this is so perfect. But she didn't know that's how we would view her. She ends up by saying like, and I'm about to go out and sing diamonds are a girl's best friend. I'm going to do a little dance at the end. And I think they'll love it. I don't know. I read these books very like enmeshed in whatever story they're telling me. And then I usually close it and I'm just like, wait a second. <laughs> what <laughs> right. did I just read? It like all hits me in a moment. And so I will say like going back to the very beginning, the childhood stuff is like quite abbreviated because I feel like they just don't have that much information on it other than the things she said in the papers or journal entries we've seen. Her marriage to Mr. Doherty, there is no fucking way that that was just like a calm, normal marriage. And their only issue was that he wanted a baby and she wasn't ready to have a baby. Are you fucking kidding me? A 21-year-old marries a 16-year-old and their only conflict between them is like, who's ready to have kids? Not just a 16-year-old, an orphan who has been told she's like unlovable. An orphan who marries him to get out of the foster system? Right. And there's no like violence or danger in their marriage. Yeah, fucking right. <laughs> I do love how Corinne and I both came into this like she totally wrote it. And like <laughs> now we're like, oh, my gosh, you're right. She did. Yeah. <laughs> now I, I'm fully convinced she didn't write this book. <laughs> You've turned us. Honestly, I finished this book like half an hour ago and I was like, did she write it? And then like as I was setting up my computer, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I will say, OK, just to, because I did perceive it as her writing it, I very much have been going through like a really big mental health like shift. I was just in like a trauma treatment. And so I have that lens going into it and reading it. And I've been doing a lot of like inner child healing. And there's this one, I I'm going to read it because like I almost was brought to tears because of it. She says, when I have to be somewhere for dinner at eight o'clock, I will lie in the bathtub for an hour or longer. Eight o'clock will come and go and I still remain in the tub. 
I keep pouring perfumes into the water and letting the water run out and refilling the tub with fresh water. I forget about eight o'clock at my dinner date. I keep thinking and feeling far away. Sometimes I know the truth of what I'm doing. It isn't Marilyn Monroe in the tub, but Norma Jean. I'm giving Norma Jean a treat. And that was like really, really powerful for me. She acknowledges like she still is this child, which maybe is very self-aware, but because I'm in that place right now, it was very touching. And I related to that. I was like, hell yeah, take your two hour long bath and don't go to that dinner because you should treat yourself. And she wasn't able to take, you know, long baths growing up. I guess even though I don't believe that she wrote this, and I do believe that her story is exploited to the masses, I do think that there are elements of this book that are very thoughtful and like really make you consider the way that we have talked about her and the way that her life has been portrayed. And even though this is just another portrayal, I think that in terms of the way Hollywood treats women, there are elements of it that I don't think are like the worst thing someone has put out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What you were saying about the bath story, having a lot of self-awareness, I do wonder if that came from her. And I do think there's something to be said about somebody being able to understand you better than you've understood yourself. Like a lot of times the way we act in response to like a trauma is quite readable to other people. I think Minka Kelly, if she told her own story in her late 20s, it would not have been the most honest version of her story right. that maybe a friend or like a guardian could have told. Yeah. Because if you were somebody Marilyn loved and you knew she had this habit of taking long baths when she had to be somewhere and you knew her story, I think it'd be easy to say, I think you're doing this to like heal your inner child. I think it, there's something to you that you get to finally treat yourself. And you finally get to put yourself first in a way you've never been able to in your whole life. She talked about her childhood, how it was very understood that her needs came first. I mean, that story about how she always got to take the last bath, so she had the dirtiest water. We could also view that as someone else writing that because they start yes. with that story. And then they later yeah. on, it's like she gets to take control. She gets to refill the bath multiple times. Sometimes we are just so fucking on the nose as people. Yeah, right. And I kind of think this would be that story, like you would be out at dinner and she'd be like, sorry, I was taking a bath. And then you'd go home and you'd be like, you'll never believe this moment of self-sabotage that's just so clear to onlookers. And I don't know a lot about Marilyn Monroe. I've like actually spent a lot of my life actively trying to not look into it because I get so upset by the way she's been like yeah, bastardized. Right. But I'm like, was she given the opportunity to ever really like look at herself and think about it and like heal at all or even put it together? Because I know when you're like running like this, her whole life was such a sprint. Like she was sprinting to survive childhood. She was sprinting to get through fame. And then she died so young. Sometimes when you're like going that fast through life, it's crazy how little you're able to reflect. And I wonder how much self-reflection she was ever able to really do. We're reading this, piecing together the different themes that we see, but perhaps if she did write this, she was just truly writing down the facts and didn't have that self-reflection to think back to it, like the bath, or even just if we think about all the times when she felt most comfortable, it seemed to be when she was lying down and fantasizing about what her life could be. And even there was an audition where it was the first audition that she felt like she truly was being viewed as an actress. And this was her opportunity to read a script and it wasn't necessarily completely about her body and she needed to lie on the floor to like give herself that comfort and to remember the fantasy she had for who she could be herself too. That wasn't written. That's just what I was thinking about as I was reading it. So did she think about that? Or was this just a weird story where she laid down on the floor during an audition? Yeah, it's interesting. Or like, is that something only someone out external would pick up on? And I do agree with Ashley's like original thing that I do believe this was written by somebody who was researched and probably did have her journals. And I don't know, there is something about her, I guess, because she died young and she was such an icon to people. And she is such like a version of a woman that like men and women, everybody wants to like explain or get to the bottom of that. If you're given like raw info, you're like, I got it. I got the answers. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like, I totally get you. Another thing that makes us feel like a very researched piece of fan fiction is we know, I think based on like her journal entries, that she is deep in fantasy and in thought a lot of the time. But I think that from other people's perspectives, they would see her just kind of standing in the corner, not talking to anyone at parties. And this book like combines those two perspectives. Like when she's at home, she's lying in bed and she's deep in fantasy. But there are passages from this book where she says like, I would go to parties and just stand there and not think of anything. 
Mm-hmm. And it's right. like, well, I'm sure the real Marilyn Monroe wasn't like in the corner of a party, zero things between the ears. Like, I'm sure she was thinking of something. And like, there's a lot in here about how she like never really wanted to talk at parties and she didn't like piping up in conversation really. And a lot of times she would go and just kind of participate with her presence and then go home having said no words and had no thoughts. And I'm just like, well, that surely can't be true. To play devil's advocate a little bit because – I really relate to that and and not the like empty thought thing, but like I hate social situations, especially parties. I was at a wedding recently. This is like morbidish kind of, but like also how my brain works. I was at a wedding and not yours. I was just about to say mine. (laughs) (laughs) I thought you had a great time. I had a great time at your wedding. (laughs) No, this was like back in October and I was like in a kind of like low place mentally and I was looking around. It almost felt like I was in a circus. And it was like, everyone is just putting on this act and how are they having fun and just ignoring the fact that like, it's like all a fake, like, you know? So I was just sitting back and watching it and observing. I didn't want to contribute and I didn't feel connected to it. And I was more of just observing. And that I believe in your mind at that party, you were like watching a circus. You know what I mean? Like you are sitting there having like an interpretation of it. And I feel like the way she writes about these experiences in the book, I'm sure she's like said in interviews and maybe said in her journal, like, I don't think about anything. I just sit there and watch. And so then the way they interpret it in this book is like, she doesn't think about anything. She just sits there and watch. But like, I do that sometimes, you know, I'll go to a party and I, you just like watch what's happening around you, but I don't go home. And then I haven't existed in that moment. Like, right. I was there. I was thinking things. (laughs) I would think that if you've been to this many Hollywood parties, especially in that era of Hollywood, If you went home and like reflected in your journal about what you saw there at that party, there would be some crazy shit that you watched. You know what I mean? And they would surely make it into a memoir. The only stories that we have from these parties are the ones that have definitely been reported on, like Zsa Zsa Gabor screaming at her. That made it into the magazines. But if she wasn't like a standout at these parties, like she wasn't the center of attention, then her stories from the parties weren't making it into the magazine. So she was just at the party, but like she must have seen things and thought things. You know what I felt like was really missing from this that I think a real memoir might've had is why she's an actress. I think the one line we get is I was pulled to a photographer's studio, like a duck to water. And that's (sighs) not it. I think having read maybe 100 actor and actresses memoirs, there's, either a longing to be loved and be seen and to have a crowd and to find acceptance and to have power and prestige. Or I feel like sometimes they're like, I just wanted to make money. I knew that this was my best shot at making the most money. And obviously both of those things are true for her and you can read yourself, but it's never really spoken on. There's never really an explanation for why she kept going and why she was doing it. And she wants to get good at it. But we've had a lot of stories that the first time they go to an acting class and they feel seen, Jane Fonda, who went to acting class with Marilyn Monroe and feeling seen for the first time and being like, this is what I need to do because my whole life I've put on this fake face to get through and survive and get along. And then suddenly I was somewhere where somebody was looking at me and saying, no, you have more in you. I see who you really are. Be that person. And for a lot of these people, it's like their gateway to therapy. It's like the first time in their life they're allowed to access the emotions they've been running from for so long. I have to imagine Marilyn had a similar experience because I know that taking these serious acting classes was so important to her. And I do feel that like that was missing. I have to imagine that that feeling of like when I'm acting, I'm free would have been in there. She did say, and this is kind of earlier on and I can't remember the specific line, but I think she does say when like she got to a certain age, like she finally felt seen in a way that she never had before, which is when she started to create her Marilyn Monroe persona. But yeah, I I feel like it's not explicitly shared. I also feel like that would be a different scene. You know what I mean? Like, if you're being seen for the character you're portraying, that's so different than being seen for who you are, which is what I think a lot of people resonate with in acting and like those classes where they break you down to nothing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. That is an interesting thing because even in the final few chapters of the book, she still prioritizes being seen in publications as Marilyn Monroe over making money. Like, she just enjoys people looking at her more and Joe DiMaggio's like, yeah, but shouldn't you be paid? Like, where's the money? And she's like, who cares? Like, everybody's staring at me. Everybody sees me. And that seems to be a priority. But it almost contrasts with what we know about the acting because there was this one line that stuck out to me because it felt so out of place where she was talking about acting and how she would say two lines and then it would stop. And then they'd move the camera and they'd reset up the lights and she would have to say another two lines. And she was getting frustrated because she was like, 
just as I'm getting into all of my characterization, it's cut short. And it just felt odd and out of place because she hadn't really said much about her desire or her passion or what drew her to acting. So suddenly I was like, oh, well, now she has all of these kind of quirks and expectations and frustrations with who her character is. Whereas I guess not knowing Marilyn and not hearing anything in the book about why she did acting, I was just kind of like, oh, I thought she just showed up and said a few lines. And that was just because someone offered it to her and not necessarily because something drew her to it. It's so weird now that I think about it even more the way that there's years of her frustrations of like not even getting a walk on role. Every time she even walks on camera, the scene gets cut. And then every studio in town tells her she's not photogenic. And then she's like, and then I did Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And, you know, those were really fun to make. And then we jump ahead into she's a star and she has all these frustrations. It's one sentence. That's so weird. You know what else is odd, too, about the whole section with the, oh, she just has these sexual vibrations that she can't turn off and just standing there, she can't control it. And from the time she's 13 years old, she puts on a sweater that's too tight and everybody is just like gawking. Auga. (laughs) I also get a lot of, I don't know this from the book, but I know this from like being in America and also from Jane Fonda's book that we just read. She famously was able to turn it on and off. There's all these accounts of people who are like, you know, she would turn it on. She'd be Marilyn Monroe and people would flock to her. And then when she was ready to stop, she would just become Norma Jean and she wouldn't be recognized on the street. And Jane Fonda's like, I followed her out of an acting class one time and she hailed a cab and not one person knew. And there we were in the middle of New York City and nobody knew who we were looking at. I'm a little bit suspicious of her being like, I just can't control it. All anybody sees is sex. Since I was 12 years old, I'm a siren and nobody knew what to do with me. But then there's all these other accounts that you 100% were in control. But then it's like, is that also like what we were talking about before of the women hating on other women? Is that a narrative of a woman hating on Marilyn? You know, it's, it's hard to know. Earlier in the book, she did talk about taking her makeup off and walking around on Sunday so that she could just be herself and not be ogled at, I guess. So we got just like a tiny little snippet of it, but very early before she had any fame. I think ultimately like the takeaway is just like how sad, regardless of what is the truth, she had a really tough upbringing and she probably didn't even know who she was because even now, like we don't know who she was because everyone is telling her who she is or everyone's telling Mm -hmm. the world who they think she is. And that breaks my heart because it sounds like if this was written by her or it wasn't, it just sounds like she just wanted to be loved in a way that she couldn't and wasn't as a child. Yeah, I will say one of the things that feels unfortunately probably true or just like the thing that is heartbreaking and like really seeps through the pages is what you're saying is the loneliness. The fact that she was raised in a way where she like never got to connect with anyone because she didn't have any family and she was just a part of these families as housing. She didn't have anyone that she like was truly a part of like no family that she was a part of through her entire life. And so then as she got older and every single thing in her life was a transaction, everyone was a part of her life for like work or for whatever. She just never understood how to connect with people, I believe. And I don't think that she died knowing what true companionship was. It breaks my heart. It's so sad. What are your thoughts on how many older couples seemed to take her under their wing? It made me anxious every freaking time. (laughs) Same. Every time an old man talked to her, I was like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. I guess it gives you hope that there are good people in the world. You go, this girl needs parents and we will be her parents for the week or something. I think I just have skepticism about most people. So (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Ulterior motives. The police officer cutting her screen is the most disturbing, horrifying story. This also made me wonder, okay, so if it's not written by Marilyn, could it be written by a woman? Because the depictions of the police officer coming in, basically memorizing her address and coming to assault her, and just the way that men approached her on the street and Kat called her, there were themes throughout the entire book where I was like, wow, life has not changed (laughs) for women one bit. This could have been written today. That police story, I had the exact same feeling. I said that police story could have been last week. The way that they're like, can you not rat him out? It would just be really bad look for us that one of our own used his power of authority. He just had a kid. Like, he's married. Let's not ruin his life. One of the things that makes me think that it was written by like a not like other guys guy, a pick me boy, 
<laughs> is the way she is still very sexy in these stories. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And when the policeman breaks into her house, she is wearing a new style of nightgown that goes just to her upper thighs. Okay. Why was that? an important detail and then she's like a scared woman she goes to her neighbor's house and she calls the police wrapped in a quilt and i'm just like you're wanking to this story aren't you (laughs) there's a couple lines that i feel like are very much like twitter parody lines of being like the woman looked in front of the mirror she had breasts for the first time she stared at them lovingly she loved her new curvy body (laughs) totally and there was one other story when she's talking about the types of men that there are and how she prefers the wolves, the men who like will just make a pass at you and then you reject them and then it's over. But there are other types of men who are nice to you and it turns out they actually do want something. And it feels like a little internal thing from the guy who's writing this being like, but I'm not like either of them. I'm one of the good, good ones. I don't even want anything from you other than you to tell your story and for you to love me. Right? Or what about that her favorite type of man is an intellectual who has so much to teach you about the world and a man with glasses. You're like, but oh, but he can't have nice teeth. His teeth have to be <laughs> yeah. a little bit crooked. The sexiest woman in the world. What she's looking for is just a smart man who will teach her a little something with glasses and a fucked up tooth. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> let's look up with this editor. What's his name? Walter something. Let me tell you. Milton H. Green. I wonder what he looks like. <laughs> what does he look like? Oh, yeah, don't trust a man with perfect teeth. I mean, maybe a good mono. Don't, maybe just don't trust men. Oh, you know what I loved? This is one of my favorite stories from it is the way that she wrote or whoever wrote. When I act in these movies, they're basically fantasies that I made up when I was a kid. I love to picture that behind those doors of the studio execs are actually all their kids writing these movies, not them, but that is written by children. And I was like, oh, I love that. There is such a world where she like never got to be a kid and it does make me so sad like the stories of her like being married and like sneaking out to go play in the streets with the kids and then having to like go home to her husband. That stuff was like heartbreaking to me how badly she just like wanted to have fun and be a kid. Yeah. Okay. Should I just to kind of wrap it up read the Milton H. Green Wikipedia? Yes. Yes. Okay, so Green is initially a high fashion photographer who shoots all the famous people is with Taylor, Frank Sinatra, Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly, Ava Gardner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Green's work with Marilyn Monroe, who he shot in 1953 for the first time, changed the course of his career. The two struck up a friendship, and when Monroe left Los Angeles to study acting in New York City, she stayed with Green and his wife and their kids. Together with Green, Monroe formed Marilyn Monroe Productions, a production company, in an effort to gain control of her career. Green would go on to produce Bus Stop and The Prince and the Showgirl. The two also collaborated on some 53 photo sessions. One of those sessions is like the most famous photo of all time. Their friendship ended after the production of The Prince and the Showgirl in 1957, and they decided to separate. Does it say why? No, but interesting then that this book would be edited by somebody she's no longer friends with. Yeah. Suspicious. Very. That was in 1957. So he can no longer use her likeness to benefit his career, but perhaps he can use her story. This book was produced in 74, some 18 years after they stopped speaking and like 10 or 15 years after she died. Her death. Yeah. To summarize, we're never going to know the truth. Yes. Yes. Until her ghost steps in and has a word. Enter part two, the seance. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, This is such a fun conversation. I mean, obviously, you guys are interested in the ghost stories. I was this whole time we were recording. I was kind of like, all right, I'm ready to actually hear these. (laughs) I was like, let's talk about stupid books. Which is funny because we're the opposite. Well, I'll speak for myself because I feel like we don't get to talk about books like this. Yeah, this was so exciting. Can't wait to dive in. And we're both readers. So this was really fun. Oh, my God. Well, books are for dorks and ghosts are for cool people. (laughs) (laughs) That's so true. We're all well-rounded now. Yeah. There we yeah. go. Yeah. So please, if you have any interest, check them out. We'll be on an episode of Sabrina and Corinne that also comes out today. Two Girls, One Ghost. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so fun. I hope you guys enjoyed. I love you guys so much. I hope everyone had a great three-day weekend. And we will see you next week. And until then, who do we love more than anybody else?